is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Elder Empire, Shadow Book One of Shadow and Sea, chapters 20, 21, 22, and 23. That's right, kids. Four chapters. In these chapters, uh, we get to see through flashbacks a little bit more of what went down with the Emperor. I still am not totally sure. I think he's being taken over by the end of that scene. We'll see. And then there's another face-off with Calder, who seems very aware of Shara's newly awakened weapon. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to George for commissioning this episode. So these chapters were very eventful. I mean, these books, they all are paced in such a way that it's rare for me to feel like not a whole lot happened in this section, which can happen with some books. And that's not to say that, like, I don't usually say that just because maybe there was a lot of scenes of people standing around talking instead of fighting. That, for me, does not constitute not a lot happened, because a whole lot can happen in a conversation, whether or not there's action. Um, But, you know, there are some books that it feels like certain things can be really drawn out, and Will White does not have that problem (laughs) at all. He gets to points so quickly that you almost can't believe it's already happening. And I feel like that is how I'm feeling about the reveals with the Emperor and what happened with Nikothi. Um And speaking of, let me see, how many chapters are there in this book? Uh, 27. So I might be heading into like the last episode or two episodes of the book pretty shortly. Uh, I'm going to have to double check that because thankfully George sent me a little uh, spreadsheet on how to divide up the the chapters because the page markers weren't telling me. Um, so wow. Yeah. We're getting right into the final stretch here. I guess it makes sense that we're finding out as much as we are at this point, but I think I expected it to take longer in terms of maybe even into the next book, you know? Um, and you guys said that these are two trilogies that are simultaneously happening. So we've got a lot of room for other things uh, ahead of us if we're already getting to this point with this storyline. So I'm going to start off with chapter 20. Because sometimes I'll jump around. But chapter 20 has a really interesting opening. This is Lucan reading the memories of this knife. And this is sort of compelling to me because I thought when we saw him awaken it, that we were going to have seen the last of it. Just him awakening it would be all we needed to see. Um, So the fact that we're actually getting into these memories is pretty compelling. I'm interested. The totem man is the only one in the refugee tunnels trusted to make bronze. Once he worked the forges of Orgnot, blending the alloys that became the chains, cages, and muzzles, keeping human slaves in check. He has little knowledge of his own. In an age before alchemy, he is something less than an alchemist. When he pours this batch of bronze into its mold, he adds a splash of his own special concoction, a potion he believes that will allow the metal to steal souls. The bronze cools into ingots, making their way to a smith. He knows the totem man is a little crazy. But crazy or not, he delivers good material. Maybe the metal will steal souls and maybe not, but the smith knows what matters. The skill of the craftsman. It's up to him to make blades that will kill anything. 
He's heard all the tales of the Liberator, going around murdering great elders and their servants, so the smith is determined to do his part. And I'm assuming the Liberator in capital is the Emperor. His blades will free mankind. His blades will cut through the immortality of the elders. Every beat of his hammer carries that intent. In Lucan's mind, the scene shifts. The reader kneels inside a trench, pouring her intent into these fresh forged weapons. Now that she's about to die, her mind is sharper and more focused than ever. The forces of, and forgive me, I am not going to pronounce this correctly. I listened to the audiobook on this, and I don't remember how she says this. Kafenkar? Kafenikar. I think it's Kafenikar. Uh, surround the trench, squirming over the ground like mobile nests of tentacles. And I'm assuming Kafenikar is another elder, because there were many, evidently. Um... She can hear them on the approach, a sound like a thousand slurping tongues. No one captured by the warm lord returns with their sanity, in sanity intact, so she has no intention of being taken alive. But before she dies, she invests all of her hopes, her dreams, and her wishes into these newborn blades. She urges them to leech power from their targets, to wound and weaken the enemy so that it can one day be destroyed. She believes that's the only way to defeat an elder creature, to erode it from the inside. Sometime later, on a land Lucan will know as the Grey Island, an assassin kneels. For years, she has served the Mistress of the Mists as one of the Amharani, an order of killers for hire in this long war. Now, their whole order has been hired by the man they call the Liberator, the one who has lived longer than any other and who will one day lead mankind. As a symbol of their new contract, the Mistress's twelve most capable servants each repair, receive a pair of bronze knives. So there are twelve pairs out there. I don't know if we know what's happened to all of them, because there's only three gardeners at the moment. Um... The assassin's focus bleeds into the shiny new weapons. With these blades, she will cut down the Liberator's enemies. She will deliver death with one strike, and she will never need a second. Then the blade draws blood again and again and again and again. So I really love that, like, look into the blade's history, how this these layers of intent work. This is the sort of thing that, you know, it, it's treated as fiction, but I do think there is something to this energy. You know, um, I, I have put a lot of stock in the feel of secondhand objects being different than, than new objects. I just, you go into a thrift store or an antique store and there is just a heaviness when you step in the door. And I don't think it's just because there's dust or, you know, like, I'm sure that is part of it. But I really believe that there are some items that if they were a focus for somebody for a long time who had a really potent history and maybe intense relationship with that object. I think that can come across and make it f like s feel different to someone who's coming at it for the first time. So this sort of is a much more, what's the word I want? It's a much more sort of distilled version of what I think is actually something that happens. Um, and it's of course, done purposefully, which is a very different thing as well, because people are aware that intent has actual power here. Um, so let's see. In that core was a common thread, a seed of inspiration, if only he could seize it. With enough time, Lucan could awaken the knife, but that process would lock the object in a single form. It would never absorb intent again, and Shara would add her story to this blade, such that when it was uh, when it finally was awakened, it would rival any weapon the Empire had ever produced. One day, elders will tremble before this blade, but not today. So, this is the same 
blade that he had, I thought, awakened last last chapter. But he thinks that there, like, because it says with enough time he could awaken the knife. I thought that he had succeeded in awakening the knife. Is that, am I wrong? Is this a different knife? Because it's described as being bronze. Oh, George is saying this is the past. Oh, I didn't even see that 10 years ago. So, okay. So he's basically in the past thinking through what the blade will eventually be, which it has become very recently. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I just, I don't know. I thought this was really interesting. And I'm also fascinated by this like potion that was, that was folded into the metal somehow. I'm very curious about that because it sounds like that guy was fairly confident it would do something. And it's, it doesn't seem to have worked the way that he intended it initially, but it feels as if the awakening has activated whatever was poured into it to cause that to finally reach its full potential. And uh, that's a bit of a surprise. It's no wonder that we're seeing those like green hands pressing up against from the inside. The absorbing of souls seems to be a thing that may have happened. This is something that, uh, you know, there are other weapons in fantasy that I have seen allegedly collect souls. And I have always found that to be a really, really upsetting power. I know that it's like uh, sort of a it's it's meant to be intimidating in a way that's extremely dreadful and i am very interested to see what it's like in the hands of a, an alleged protagonist you know uh that's not usually the kind of weapon a protagonist has and i really wonder what share is going to make of it um so anyway so then we go into the next section. And again, this is also in the past, which for some reason that registered, but this did not register as being in the past. Um, and they are heading towards the island on this mission that he had told them about the emperor in the previous chapters that Lucan was so nervous about, but she was just kind of taking in stride. And the ship is is so peaceful and sort of relaxing that she has managed to fall asleep and is really rather enjoying sleeping on a ship. And then it says when the ship crashed, she awoke in midair. So that's like how much she gets thrown by the ship's crashing. Um, and I was sort of thinking, because it says ship crash, and I was like, Maybe it didn't crash. Maybe this is a storm or maybe, you know, but no, that is basically what happened here. Um, it says, whatever's happening on deck, it has to be better than this. This is her uh, getting like deciding that she is going to go above decks. And I have read and I'm curious how many people have experienced this. I have been on a boat. Um, it was a small ferry that was being tossed around quite a bit. It wasn't a storm, but it was one of those really choppy days. And I was surrounded by, there probably were about 40 people on board and everybody was vomiting. It was just one of those trips where it was like, we just have to get across. I don't know if they turned around and went back right away. They may have just bided their time by the time we actually got to the island. But uh, it was really really awful because everybody was throwing up and there were people like staff on board trying to clean it up and they were going around cleaning vomit with this incredibly strong smelling cleaner so then in the air there was this awful mixture of like a chemical floral scent allegedly and the smell of vomit and i didn't throw up but because i was like doing these deep breathing things but there were times where I was like, maybe I should just let myself, maybe that would be better. Maybe I would stop feeling this horrible if I just let myself throw up. Um, however, I was like above decks. I was able to see it wasn't that like traumatic. Has anybody ever been below decks during something like that? 
because I have read stories of like from that perspective with people being sort of tossed around in the hold, but it's all, you know, it's fiction written by people that I am assuming have never gone through that. Is it worse? Is it worse to be below decks in the dark, just being knocked around and probably banging into luggage and cargo? Or is it worse to be above decks where there's waves that can take you overboard and wind and just there's no shelter, you know, because you're not sheltered above. But if you go below, good luck if something hits the ship and then it starts to go down. You have to find a way up to the top and out before you just wind up going down with it all. And I really don't know what I would hate more. <laughs> I just both of them sound so awful to me. I think I think I'd probably rather be below decks in theory, but I don't know. And also, this all depends on whether or not you know anything about sailing, which I don't. So that's, I would also just prefer to be out of the way of people who actually know what they're doing. Anyway, so this is the first time that Shara sets eyes on the dead. And I appreciate that as much as she doesn't show externally that much of a reaction she is truly horrified by this and says to herself how this is like the stuff of nightmares. And there's a real sense of her being like, I was not ready for this. Oh my God. And there's this thing. It took me again, I was doing the audiobook for this section. And I was like, when, when the narrator gets to this certain part, I went, excuse me. So the description begins at first she could only see a pale mound of bones like a small island made from human skulls lashed together then something pushed its way through the cave at the front the long pale neck of a giant slug with a human head as big across as any ship's sail the disturbing face turned toward them its expression full of mourning and let out a howl Shara staggered her way over to the outer railing for a closer look, all around the skull tortoise. Did anybody else piece together what that was supposed to be before they saw the words skull tortoise? Because I didn't. Once I got to that, I was like, oh, oh, no. Like, it, it all clicked into place and I absolutely could see it. But up till that point, that was not where my mind was. And it took me very off guard and somehow was so much worse. Like, I don't know what it is about this creature that its attempt to imitate an already extant living thing is so much worse. Because we saw, like, there were other beings that were made into, like, bat-like creatures and whatnot on the island that we went to already. But there's something about this. I think it's because bats are like an animal that we often associate with sinister stuff as well as spiders. You know, there's all the like Halloween animals is what I think of them as. Um, and a, a tortoise shouldn't be. A tortoise is supposed to be one of the good guys. They're slow. They're amiable. They just kind of chill in the sun. They don't, they're not like predators, you know, there's nothing about them that feels scary. So for some reason, it's very offensive to me to turn this thing into a tortoise. I just, I, I don't like it. I'm just saying. So <laughs> the chimera that had been pulling the ship is fighting with this thing and it winds up just snapping like through the uh, shell and it's pretty badass actually this leviathan um it is a uh deep strider as it turns out and it is under the emperor's control he has like a whistle and a uh sort of it feels like emotional tied to it somehow um I love this too, that Maya is like asking, what is this? Her voice full of horror. For once, Shara knew how she felt. Killing men had never bothered her, but this, this was the stuff of nightmares. And I like that moment being sort of an acknowledgement of how often 
Shara probably sees her friends reacting to things and doesn't really understand why they're reacting the way they are. And how nice it must be to have a moment here where she's like, oh, we're on the same page finally. It's happening. Yay. Not exactly the circumstances one would hope for, but there it is. Um, a group of the corpse crabs had swarmed onto the, the deep strider's tail, slicing off long bits of flesh and sending purplish blood dribbling back into the water. And this is just really like, the, the, it just keeps being so horrifying. Um, the emperor says, I have steered us through my own defenses. These are the children of the dead mother. And he pulls the deep strider away using this whistle and is like, so we got to ditch the ship. And he jumps over the side and, uh, Everybody follows except for Shara. Like, even Lucan, he gets down there before she does. And this is something that's sort of fascinating throughout this whole scene, both now and it continues on in a later chapter. Shara isn't on board. And I mean that literally and, uh, literally and figuratively. She doesn't feel right about this mission. Something is off to her. And... I trust her judgment on that and her instincts on that. So I have to assume either the emperor has finally either caved to Nakothi entirely. It's, it's unclear for me by the end of this. It seems like he has given himself over to Nakothi by the end of this section. But had he already... Or was the way he handled this mission simply like peppered with moments of him listening to Nakothi's guidance rather than his own judgment? And eventually he gives in like, because, you know, it, I could see it being a sort of a gradual thing where he makes some decisions that he would make in his right mind enough to fool him into thinking he's still doing the right thing and just enough goes wrong. That when he like comes back to himself, he doesn't think that it's impossible to save the situation until he winds up in a spot like the one he does. I don't know, though. I may be totally misreading. It may have been a sudden moment because we see uh, when we get there how much despair he seems filled with. And I don't think that's Nakothi. I think that is his own despair. It could be egged on. But it seems like the frustration is all actually his. So I don't know. But the the whole sense that you get from Shara here is just like, oh, this is not part of the deal. Like, I didn't. What? This isn't being a gardener. Um, she pauses for a long moment and long enough to watch Luke and drop down onto the deep strider ahead of her. And she's really genuinely stopping and going like, I, can I do this? And then all of a sudden the dead children are coming up the sides of the ship and Shara is just like, Oh my God. Okay. I really have to go. At the last instant, when she pushed off into a jump, her foot slipped on the damp wood. Shara fell, which is just a, I think really great analogy for how this whole thing is going for her. She is just something isn't sitting right and it's causing her hesitations to have like unintended consequences. And it's not exactly like a fault of hers. You know, it's almost like her instinct is trying to act on her behalf against the will of her body. Um, and she goes down and there's a moment where she's just totally disoriented, which uh, I don't know how many of y'all have experienced that being underwater and not knowing which way is up. But I had this happen getting caught in a riptide when I was in, um, I think I was in Costa Rica at the time. And it is one of the scariest sensations I can, like, I can remember experiencing myself. It's truly you think that like when you watch somebody go through that, just where are the light's coming from, but you don't stand, you're not still enough in the water to tell where the light's coming from. And the moment where you realize you thought you were kicking for the surface, but you were going down. Ooh, it's not good. I do not care for it. And I wouldn't recommend it. Um, 
I just barely got out of that in time, me and a friend. And it was like, we both were shaking afterwards because if there was a big reef like way down the beach and we were being carried straight toward it, we would have been fucking shredded. Um, so yeah, she goes down and there's something deep in the water that is clearly reaching up for her that she thought was somebody from above trying to pull her out. And she's like, Oh oh God. Okay. I'm getting out of here. And when she finally gets pulled out, um, by the emperor, the deep strider is there and it's opening its mouth and you can feel her thinking, Oh my God, it's going to eat me. And instead it snaps down on this fucking, uh, tentacle creature. And, and once again, this deep strider is on our side and the emperor says next time jump sooner. And I really felt for the emperor at this moment because he's put a lot into training these guys. And if she had died here, <laughs> he would have been mad. Um, so this is where uh, we reached the actual island. Shara couldn't believe she hadn't noticed it before. And we see that again, this island being made of, of flesh and something that she hadn't like, this is a scene where the horror of it really sinks in for her because she hasn't been here before. When we read the arrival at the other Island in previous chapters, this was essentially old hat to her. Like she'd already been someplace like this. So there wasn't that much of a reaction, but as they arrive, there's just, a, there's not a lot of like, description of Shara cringed in horror. You know, it's not like that. It's just a slight addition of words here and there to give us the sense of how uncomfortable and off her game she is here. She's just not in her element. And Lucan, he is experiencing some real like assault on his senses. Um, and he says that he can feel the battle from here. So, the ship is called the Eternal. Every inch of the ship was red. The sails were furled, but she could clearly tell that they were the color of bright, fresh blood. The hull was made of naturally red planks, and the quick lamps hanging from the bow and stern glowed like the rising sun. Most noticeably, the Eternal seemed to drift on a tide of flame rather than water. Orange fire licked at the bottom of the ship, illuminating the surrounding water in sunset hues. The wooden belly had been charred black, but the flames neither died nor grew. They lapped patiently at the ship's sides, as though they would never run out of fuel. What? That's rad. I want to see this. Really, really bad. It's some... I know that a lot of uh, Will's work generates like fan art and I'm curious if somebody has drawn this because ah, if I was an artist, I don't think I'd be able to resist that one. So this is where he says the navigator and owner of that ship is Cheska Bennett, a very promising young woman. When she realized the nature of her voyage, she alerted me immediately. Even had she not, it is not illegal for a navigator to accept a contract. I am dying to know how she notified him, like what exactly she did. Can you just basically yell out emperor problem? And like, you know, cause he's got a lot of power. I don't know what he's able to do. Um, the deep strider slithered past the ship, pressing its chin against the soft skin of the beach so they could depart. Ew. I hate every mention of the fact that this is flesh. Ugh. So, as the chimera leaves, Shara's like, so you can call it back for us to get out of here? And the emperor's like, oh no, if we are getting out of here, we're going on that rad ship over there. If we aren't on that rad ship, then we ain't getting out. So everybody uh, get ready. And this is when he explains that the person who is here mining for one of the hearts, who betrayed his guild... He says he knows far more than the secret to my youth. He had to know exactly where Nakothi died, how to reach this place, and that the dead mother once had 11 other hearts. I've only shared that knowledge with one other soul. Could he have given you up? Lucan asked. 
She is not capable of betrayal, the emperor responded in a tone more certain than sunrise. And I'm like, does that mean that she's dead? Does that mean that she's been silenced in some magical way? I don't. Um, I don't know where this watchman found his information, but before this day is out, I will. And at this point, Shara says, the, this man who betrayed the Black Watch, what's his name? And the emperor won't say. And that's part of the thing that Shara's feeling a little bit weird about as things continue on. Um... First, he shares ancient imperial secrets. Then he takes us on a secret mission to remove a target we know nothing about. No one knows we're here. There's no record of this assignment. He's rushing us forward, keeping us from asking questions. Why? And why us? Why did he need three gardeners in the first place? So... That chapter ends with them seeing that there is a uh, bunch of men standing outside of this sort of like mausoleum and sprinting forward. Then we go into chapter 21 and <laughs> this I was not ready for at all. Uh, this thing. Okay. She saw what looked like a newborn star hovering over the center of the island. Uh, the star-like light split at the bottom, cracking and releasing a mass of writhing blue-white tentacles like a squid squeezing out of an egg. From this distance, it was hard to be sure, but what looked like little feelers on the tentacles might actually be human hands. After the tentacles reached all the way out, instead of a squid's head, the bony upper torso of a long dead woman squeezed out. It looked like the dead consultants she had fought in the crypt, as if someone had taken a human corpse and sucked all the moisture out. But this body was at least ten times larger than any human. It has two elbows, a long, flexible neck that bends like a tentacle, and the face looks wrong. And it's described as specifically like everything else about this, this body. It looks like a woman in a way. But the face just doesn't make any sense. The head didn't belong on anything natural. This thing's head had never come from any human. It was a shifting, seething mass of pulp and madness. First of all, Pulp and Madness is a great band name. Second of all, this thing, as it turns out, is not a child of Nikothi. Because I'm sitting here like, oh, that's different. And then immediately get told some very, very bad news. This is a handmaiden, which has a whole different level of power. This is basically a mini boss. We've got the boss boss. And she's like a, a mini boss. I knew many, this is the emperor's quote, I knew many who were driven to madness by exposure to a handmaiden's gaze. They have a cruel intelligence and work as overseers or managers supervising the dead mother's harvests. When the dead mother needed to build something out of specific human pieces, the handmaidens were the ones who selected the parts. Ew. I, how did this thing appear here? How did this happen? How did it get here? Is it just their attempt to destroy the heart that summoned it somehow? It feels like somebody like notified it and told it, hey, so we're all going to get together around seven here for some drinks if you just want to. What is it? Why is it here? What the fuck? Is it the activation of the things in the crypts that sort of alerted it? The bodies? I mean, I don't know how this works. Um, so she has also brought a bunch, uh, as Shara thinks of it, an audience and runs into a bunch of other children on her way. This is just fucking chaos at this point. Um, because there are so many creatures just sort of materializing out of the air. There are trees being knocked down. There are like, you know, uh, just 
like divots being ground into the dirt, huge trenches being made. Um, and she kept running, putting as much distance as she could between her and the rotten, stinking bear creature. And she's trying to find Maya, who, uh, for her part, fighting Ursaya, is having a great old time. It seems like by the time, you know, Shara actually and Lucan reach them, Maya's pretty exhausted and she's about ready to tap out. But for a minute there, she is having just as good a time as Urzaya is. And it's a really wild moment. There's something about that that I find very fun. Um, so there's this moment here where Shara notices how a bunch of consultants are being caught up by these monsters and she wants to go help them. And she has to stop and ask herself why, because she doesn't know them. She hasn't grown close to many people other than her fellow gardeners. And she doesn't understand this emotional reaction. Lucan would call it progress, but she wished it would go away. It was distracting her. And that is one of those things that it really, I can understand feeling that way. You know, I understand the advantage of shutting off your empathy during certain times, but I also like, what do you turn into then? You know, um, but it is interesting to watch her begin to have that happen without her having to consciously attempt to tap into her empathy. And I wonder how much that's going to begin to be a problem for her if it does at all. So <laughs> then we go to Lucan and he is seeing that their shit is like going left, even from his cell that he is still trapped in. It is not going well. Um, and there is like dust that is drifting from the ceiling because there's essentially what feels like an earthquake happening outside. I'm going to speed through this section because as you all know, I have a problem with time. So for the most part, what happens here is repeated attempts to break through the bars and he tries to use Siphon like out of the, like, he, he just tries to use Siphon sort of raw, for lack of a better word, as a regular knife, and it doesn't go through the bars at all. He clearly expected that it would, and it doesn't in any way. Then it's yelling, take me, in part, you know, in part, that's what it's yelling. He still has his gloves on so that he can't completely hear it. But he says, I'll take you wherever you want. Just let me out of here. The blade sank half an inch into the metal. He couldn't believe that worked. And yeah, I find that really interesting. Um, that just talking to it, it's like, well, all right. I mean, sure, we can do something. Um, so he thinks that, oh, that's good enough. I'll be able to pull this blade out and then kick the door and then it'll fall apart. It did not happen. And <laughs> He is like lamenting his lack of uh, training at this point. He's really feeling like, God damn it. I tried my best to like do push-ups and fucking jog in place, but nothing is going to be as helpful as actual training. Um, eventually after like a, a multiple attempts, one of which feels like it practically dislocated his shoulder, the fucking earthquake breaks open the latch itself like it just pings the thing open and he's looking at it like oh my god i could have just literally done nothing and just waited and i'm sure we've all been in that sort of position <laughs> where we realize like wow i like not only did i not accomplish anything but i may have actually made it worse perhaps it's a very sad moment but you all you have to feel like you're doing something i don't blame people for just flailing a little bit like it gives you the illusion of accomplishing something. It's fine. We all do it. Um, so Jirene, she is screaming at him as he vacates the place. And he stops for a moment because he is trying to decide whether or not he should help her. And he finally is like, man, look, she's a fucking worshiper of the sleepless. And we're having an elder disaster. I can't be letting this bitch out. I can't do it. 
And I was 100% on Lucan's side. I understand that it was a difficult call. Maybe he will turn out to be wrong. But with the information that he has right now, that was the correct call. And I am not mad at him for that. Um, so he winds up, as he's rushing out of here, coming across this box and a key. And I, f- I thought he was going to turn around, that these keys were going to let her out of her cell and that he might, like, oh, well, I'll toss the keys into her. But no. He has made his decision about letting her out being a bad idea. It turns out all that's in this box is his gear. And I say all in quotes because it actually is a big deal. But I was thinking there was going to be something, you know, a revelation. No, it's it's his stuff. So he gets dressed and is a gardener again. Um, so when he leaves the cell and goes outside, he has this moment where he's like, all right, shit, how do I find Shara? And realizes that because he's got reader burn and pushed himself really hard, he's going to have to try and find her like a filthy casual. He doesn't get to use his abilities and cheat a little bit. And it's not actually cheating, but, you know, like a little little bit. He has to be a basic bitch and just try and like make sense out of the world around him with his eyes and, and other senses, which sucks. Um... And he, at one point he turns around and there's this giant spider with like mandibles, like an insect. Uh, he drew a shear in half a second, driving it straight through the eye on the creature's forehead and withdrawing. Um, and this whole thing, it, it, he, I felt so bad because he just didn't know what he was stepping into. And what a shock it must be to see one of these things on his fucking island. You know, he doesn't know what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on, as far as I'm aware. Fucking, did Yala do something? Like, how? What is happening? Somebody got the heart in the last, the end of the last chapter. As far as I remember, we didn't get it back. So, did somebody try and kill it? And that's why these things are all being drawn here? Or did they do something else? Like, who has it? Because Calder is out here fighting later in a way that makes me feel like Calder isn't in control of the situation. Otherwise, I would be like, maybe this is what he wanted to do. I have a hard time believing that Calder is out here just trying to wake these things up, though. He just doesn't have the vibe. I don't know. Um, So he finally he comes across Carrion here. And at first he doesn't recognize her because she's got a purple gown on, as she puts it, dressed um, for diplomacy instead of for battle. And I do like the moment we get in her head where she's just like, man, this bitch fucked my wrist right up. And look, I'm not mad at her because she has to do what she has to do, but I feel like she didn't have to go that hard. Come on. And there's also a really interesting moment where she's realizing for the first time what the like what it must be like for people who have any kind of disability to come back and uh, to the island after they've been injured that way and just get around. And that was one of those moments that it's sort of a throwaway thing, but it is a really true, you don't know the privilege that you have until it's taken. That's just how it often works. We can do our best to be empathetic, but a lot of people don't even try to do that. So all the, the only empathy they ever develop is from a direct result of their own losses, which is kind of fucked up. That's not a great way to live. And if you ever have like been sort of dismissive of why people need, you know, accessible parking or bathrooms or whatever until you are someone who is in the position where that is how you have to live. You'll never get like how little we do for people who have disabilities. It's truly shocking. We allegedly have laws in place and they are not enforced. And I just really appreciated that commentary because she's suddenly realizing why so many people choose to retire like on the mainland in this sort of cushy, it sounds like, community. Because trying to be here, it just wouldn't work. It'd be too hard. Um, So let's see. I have to find her like an ordinary. He was cut off by Cyphron, which had kept up its constant whispering ever since its birth and had gone completely silent at the sight of the handmaiden. And I love this description. 
It wasn't silent out of fear or respect. This was the silence of a child presented with a present so unexpected, so huge, and so massively generous that the only appropriate response was a stunned silence. Oh my god. And then, like that child, Cypherin would eventually... And it begins in all caps, Give it to me! Take me there! Let me taste its spirit! Start shouting. That is a good bit. I like that a lot. Um, and I love Carrie and just being like, what the fuck is inside there? Because it begins actually sort of writhing against its wrappings. Um, and it's interesting because it's like, I wanted to think about it at first because it sounds like Nikothi's voice as if Nikothi is longing for the help of its handmaiden. But as we see, it takes power from people that it, it stabs. So it wants to be stabbed into this handmaiden because it is so insanely powerful. And it's really weird for the like weapon to be able to tell that. And it's it's just such an odd, like, I don't even really know what that means, you know? And as we find out later, evidently, objects that are, like, awakened were able to have positions on, like, a council at one point, which is just bonkers to me. Um, so we go to Maya and Urzaya, and like I said, the two of them are having a great old time. Um, at last she had a chance to release her power, to push forward and find out what this body she'd earned could do. It was the most fun she'd allowed herself to have in ages. So then we go to 22 back with Shara here. Um, and Shara, uh, as Gardner training and common sense dictated, Shara targeted the gunman first. Um, the woman in the cap was the only one with a musket. Two others had pistols, and this is ten years ago. But they kept their weapons raised, waiting for the Emperor and his assassins to get closer. They waited too long. So everybody else, as we break through this, was already dead. The Emperor <laughs> flicked his two long blades, ridding them of excess blood. His white armor had been spattered with red, and three bodies were still crumpling behind him. Yikes. The Emperor is so scary. <laughs> I really enjoy him because he seems reasonable in a lot of ways, but also just there's un an unpredictability there, and a uh, he can seem so ordinary that it you forget, you know? It's not really like how it is with some of the monarchs and whatnot in Cradle, where there's this constant sense of their presence being really heavy and intense. Like, people can veil that, but nevertheless, they all, like, have sort of signatures to their look that make them clearly a little bit leveled up from everybody else. And the Emperor just doesn't really have that. Um... So, Maya is like, so there's somebody down there in that pit. And the Emperor is like, yeah, I fucking knew he was down there. And jumps on down. Uh, Maya is like climbing. Uh, let's see. Lugan's gloves and boots seem to stick to the walls like the legs of a fly. He descended as quickly as if he were walking down a staircase. Maya merely flexed her hands and her fingernails hardened into claws. She climbed down in the same way as Shara, though with far more grace. And this is one of, you know, the first times that Shara is seeing some of what Maya's body can do. At one point, she's a little bit like uncomfortable at the sense that Maya's eyes change shape her pupils. Um, and we get more of a look at this incredibly gross island and all of the tendons and whatnot that concentrate onto one of the hearts, which does not have the same sickly look as the one that the emperor has tied around his neck. It is healthy and still pumping. Uh, and I just don't like that. They sound like they look gross and sickly anyway so for her to be like this one didn't look as sickly as his i'm like god damn that thing must be withered to a husk um 
The Black Watch traitor was older than Shara had expected, maybe 50, with the naturally tanned skin of the Vindanyas heritage. An intricate, squirming tattoo masked half his face, and the design made her nauseous for reasons she couldn't quite name. I'm curious about that. Is it that there's like a certain meaning to it that, you know, like a magic that causes a nausea because it's so against what is good and right in the world? Is it linked to something in her past that is buried and it's it's like sort of triggering a memory somehow that's causing trauma? I do not know. But he's pushing this guy's head into the floor, the moist, spongy floor. And he says that which sleeps will soon wake. There was something wrong with the emperor. His face was covered in sweat and her eyes were, his eyes were a touch glassy as though he struggled with fever. Wake, he muttered. Maybe they will. Maybe. But you won't. So he pulls out this sash and makes what he says is a pillow. And this will put you to sleep. It will give you a good night's sleep and nothing will wake you. Pleasant dreams. And he removed his boot from the man's chest and stepped back. For a second, the traitor tried to rise, but he couldn't seem to pull his head from the pillow. His eyes drifted closed as he tried to speak. But Shara heard only mumbling. His right hand lifted, then fell back down without strength. His legs kicked like a dreaming dog's. What? Can he not be killed? Is that why he's doing this? Has this guy been completely taken over by an entity that causes him to be unkillable? Um, Maya asks, would you like us to kill him? And the emperor doesn't even answer her. And May is clearly made uncomfortable by this whole demonstration. And this is when he's staggering away saying, it's not enough. It's never enough. Century after century, and it's never enough. And that's what I was talking about with this moment of it feeling like his despair causes something to shift in him. Um, Back where I started, the emperor murmured, it begins again and again and again. They're not ready. They need to be ready. They need to be better. I can make them better. I can remake them, reforge them. I can give them rebirth. And the voice of Nikothi howled through the chamber, echoing the emperor's final word, rebirth. The emperor slammed his booted heel down on the glass lantern and the light went out. So here's what I'm thinking, because Shara is wondering why he took them. Does he know he's not making it out? There's like him giving them as much information as he does before this whole mission feels like he's passing the torch And is aware that he doesn't necessarily have the strength in him to keep resisting Nikothi's pull. He'll be in the presence of two hearts, like, you know, and one of them has had what sounds like millennia to work on him. And the other one is fresh and new and vibrant still. Did he need these gardeners because they were the only thing that could kill him? Because that sounds like the kind of precaution he would take. He is a really conscious ruler, it sounds like. He genuinely knows the danger and is not, he doesn't have an ego involved the way that one would expect. I think he trained them to kill him without them realizing that's what they were put in place for. I think that might be what's going on here. Um, Whether or not, like, they wind up taking over that's a different thing but to know that the hearts are where are where his power comes from that will make them properly respectful and aware of the hearts from now on like when a mission comes up where somebody's after one they will treat that as a priority because now they understand what's at stake 
And I don't think they would have known had he not explained to them how this was working for him in that in the wrong hands. God knows. Um, yeah, that's my theory that I'm going to go with. So this is when we go to 23 and this one is the one that starts from this day forward. Non-human entity entities are no longer allowed a seat on the council of architects, which I'm just like, what? what happened? What? How was that allowed ever? Excuse me? Um, so this is when we are in Carrion's POV. And this is her re realization of how impractical the setup of the island is. Um, and <laughs> she couldn't help but feel the girl could have held back a little bit more. So she goes into, after a long climb and a lot of pain, the, like, council chamber. And this table, we finally get an explanation of some of what it can do. The one that leaves trails of yellow light after being touched. Um, Carrion pressed her palm against the surface of the table, activating her handprint. She tried to focus her intent though she was never sure how well she'd done. She wasn't a reader, so she couldn't see the results of her own intent. I am Carrion, architect of the High Council. I seek the wisdom of Bastion and the safety of the Vale. And it takes long enough that she's like, did that even work? And finally, a rectangular slice of the table's center withdrew, sliding down into itself with the scrape of stone on stone. After a moment, it slid back up. A glass box sat on top. And this is the box that I am assuming the same one that we saw Shara, you know, take her vow on. Um, the instructions she'd received upon being raised stated that she didn't need to speak the words out loud, but she felt more comfortable speaking. Our home is threatened. The veil is breached. Lend us your power and cleanse this island of that which is unclean. And for a moment, nothing happens. And then all of a sudden she starts to get the visions that a reader would get. Her hand is still on this box. Um, the sound of the wind tore around her and she had listened for almost a minute before she realized the furious wind was trying to speak to her. She will break us, Bastion's veil whispered. She understood the full story from those few words. As Carrion had been warned years ago, releasing the veil was an action of dire emergency. Using all of the mists at once would cleanse the Grey Island of Elder Spawn, but the island would go without cover for weeks afterward as the veil recovered. Now it was telling her something else, something that Yala and Tyrell hadn't known. The Handmaiden could break through the veil. If Carrion collapsed the mist and attempted to drive the elders away from the island, she'd be pitting Bastion's power against the power of the Handmaiden. The creature of Nakothi would win easily. The veil would be just as broken, requiring weeks to recover. But the elders wouldn't be stopped. They would have free reign of the Grey Island, and by the time the mist returned, there would be no one left to save. So she just has to sit back and sort of wait for somebody else to fix the fucking problem. There's nothing that she can do. Um, and that is a really like, it's wild to know that the veil has an internal security measure. I thought that it was just the function of keeping the Island hidden. And that was the security, you know, but the fact that it can be basically like a weapon, uh, that's a whole other thing. And it's unfortunate that it has this limitation, but I respect that it has one. That's fair. So this is when we go back to Shara and I'm so out of time, guys. I really tried to keep the pace up, but like I said, these are packed chapters. Um, and Shara is watching the fight with Maya and Urzaya and she's thinking about how Maya's like sort of, she says something like too shallow. If she leaned forward, the fight would have been over. And I'm like, is that? why Maya didn't is she still having fun and Shara just doesn't get that that's what's happening here um or is she actually attempting to kill him and failing like I feel like they're genuinely both trying to kill each other but maybe because of the fact that they're having a good time their intent changed a little bit somewhere in there um 
So at this point, Calder, he pulls a pistol and she almost gets hit. She is like, it's a close thing. He's still got the emperor's crown on, but now he has this cutlass, uh, long and black modeled with spots of orange that, well, they didn't quite glow, but they shifted like the patterns on a hot coal. It was as though the blobs of color on the blade weren't really there, but were made by some alchemical paint. Either he had purchased a clever forgery, or Captain Calder Martin had found himself an awakened weapon. This is funny, the, the idea of like a clever forgery. I, you know, it wouldn't function for somebody the way an awakened weapon would, but it would give everybody the fear of an awakened weapon. So I guess I can see the point of having forged weapons like that. Then people would just be like, you know what? Never mind. And I didn't want that smoke. I'm out. Thanks for coming. But I will see you later. Um, so Shara keeps on thinking, my God, I should have fucking killed him a year ago. And they start to get into it again. And then she realizes that he has an elder spawn on his shoulder. It was a stubby little thing. More humanoid than most, with dark green skin and little wings that she thought surely couldn't carry it into the air. Its black eyes glared at her with tiny fury that would have been adorable under other circumstances, and its mouth was covered by a nest of writhing, twisting tentacles. Ew. And it starts laughing and yells kill in this incredibly deep voice. And flaps off of his shoulder. So evidently, its its little wings can carry it. Um, this thing is just... I All I can think of, of course, is Dross. And it's like, is it evil Dross? Is Calder actually a bad, bad guy? Because I kind of wanted Calder to be like, you know, a little bit more nuanced than that. But I don't know, maybe he's just a villain. Like... I can't imagine teaming up with an elder spawn when we know what the elders have done to human beings through history. Like, how? That just doesn't seem... That seems rude. I don't know. Um, so they get into this fight, and he's much better than she had expected him to be. And uh, there's there's a lot here that I can't get into because of the time. Um, but... Let's see. Did you, he yells, stop where you are. And it causes her to pause just long enough when she's about to bury a shear in him that he is able to dodge. Like it's, she can shake the command the way she w was able to before, but it takes a second. It does cause her to pause. Um, and at this point, she like is seeing a, a look on his face that indicates there is something else that he has up his sleeve. And she's like, "He it, maybe he's tricking me, but I think he's too tired to pull something like that off. Um, when he started limping to the side like he meant to find a better position, she matched him from the other side. It turns out that he could feel the children coming and he leads her like into their path. He just was trying to keep her from noticing they were there so that she would wind up being right in their target zone essentially um and she uses uh what a needle on one of these children and it has absolutely no effect that she can see which i didn't think it would but it's sort of good to know um and finally she really thinks that this guy is going to kill her and then we jump to maya um and guys, I don't know. Should I wait and finish this next time? Because I'm not going to be able to give this all its time. Um, I feel like I should wait and pick this up. Because there's only a couple of pages. I think I can tack them on to the beginning of the next episode. Because uh, there's, you know, she winds up stabbing him and the whole thing. I'm sorry. Like, I just, I really did try and keep my pace. And I don't think that I went off topic very often. But yikes man is this i don't know um and there's this moment where maya is watching uh let's see 
She she was already rushing at Urziah, so instead of turning away, she doubled her ferocity, kicking off with speed he couldn't match. She didn't have to kill him. That would take too much effort. She had to tear him up and keep him out of her way. At last, she got in a clear hit, slicing through what remained of his leather breastplate and carving a line across his ribs. Even Urziah screamed, sweeping at her with his hatchets, but she'd already turned to rush for Calder Martin. And I like that Maya is thinking to herself, she's not yours as she's watching him attack Shara. It's like a territorial thing. It's not about trying to save her friend so much as like, you don't have the right to do that, which it feels is a much more animal instinct that would make sense. It's sort of linked with some of the chimera that she's tied in with. Um, so... She slams into him and he goes absolutely flying. The crown gets knocked from his head. The sword gets knocked from his hand. Everything that, you know, was giving him an edge gets sort of taken from him in a second. Um, and this is when Urziah comes in and he is beginning to try and fight with uh, Maya and Shara and Lucan steps in with the fucking... Uh, awakened what do you call it sheer um, let's see to, 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 I'm trying to find this moment here where Lucan saw the instant Maya took the black hatchet to the shoulder and it was all he could uh, it was all he could do not to pull his own shears and leap into battle himself but there was one more thing he could do to ensure the big Isrian's death so he takes this blade and tosses it to Shara and Calder looks at that blade flying through the air and he knows precisely how fucking dangerous this is. Um, Shara's hand caught her awakened shear and Lucan smiled. The blade filled her mind with whispers, not one but a thousand voices all speaking in unison. They all wanted the same thing. Power, power in his blood, power in the gold on his arm. Let me taste it. Let me taste it. Let me tear it apart and use it for us. So, Urziah spun his hatchet blade swinging at Shara's midsection, but she ducked the attack she had known was coming. The moment seemed to freeze. He was wide open, committed, his chest exposed. In her left hand, she gripped her shear the weapon with as rich a history as the empire's own. So she plunges it into his chest and the knife seems to let out this sigh of like, ah, oh, finally, thank God. Emerald lights sparked to life and floated like ball lightning around the champion's chest, running all over his body. He starts to try and talk. And he just coughs and topples backward. For an instant, the blade was covered in smears of blood, but then those evaporated. And somehow, because of her connection to the weapon, Shara felt stronger. And she's like, oh, damn. Okay. The voice of the knife was familiar. It was the blade she'd carried for years. She needed to ask Lucan its name. She was sure he'd have named it. It was something he would do. I like that she knows that. And the navigator nearby uh, <laughs> pulls the crown free and crams it on his head. Bless him. And gets his sword back. I was kind of hoping that they would have gone between him and his sword. Um, Calder drew himself up on shaky legs, feigning a strength he obviously didn't feel. Let's get to it, then, he said. Beside Shara, Maya let out a snort that might have been a laugh. Then the handmaiden of Nikothi tore off the roof. So, I have to end rather abruptly without talking about the implications of all of this, but I just wanted to at least get to the end of the chapter. So guys, stay tuned. For Friday's episode and I will talk about that of course at the top and try and be a little bit quicker with my timing. I may also have to pull back on the number of pages I'm reading a little bit. I don't know. I would rather not because things are pre-scheduled. 
we'll see what happens. But I don't want to just like speed through things without giving them any room to breathe, you know. Um, so anyway, stay tuned. I will see you all Friday. Thank you again, George. And until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.